So I'd like to introduce uh, Nicole Gilhus, PhD, who is an assistant professor in history at Pepperdine University in California. She specializes in the early modern Atlantic world with a focus on European and indigenous kinship formation. Her doctor doctoral thesis was called Atlantic Ghosts, Mi'kmaq Adoption, Daily Practice and the Rise and Fall of Colonial Revenants, 1600 to 1736. It was defended at UCLA in 2020. She, has, she also has a master's from the University of Western Ontario and a bachelor's degree from Ottawa University. Her research explores groups of colonial ghosts, which are made up of European and indigenous peoples who lived on the edges of colonial societies. Her work brings together Mi'kmaq and Acadian cultural memory and scholarship, as well as incorporating archaeology, anthropology, and historical sources. So it's my pleasure to introduce Nicole. Okay, well, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much. I would like to thank the Nova Scotian Archaeological Society for inviting me. This has been an event that was on my calendar after the end of the semester, and I just thought, when I get there, I'll be free, and I feel very excited that I am there that day. And I'd like to give a special shout out to all of the Gaidry family and kin that are in the audience today. I have loved receiving some of your emails over the last few days um, and just hearing and connecting with people of the Gaidry uh, family. So thank you for coming. Um, so I, you did do a land acknowledgement. I also want to acknowledge that we are on Mi'kma'ki territory. Um, and here I'm on Chumash territory as well in California. Um, and I, my hope is that these gatherings can be spaces where we can engage in inclusive dialogue about the past, as well as being cognizant of how history echoes in the present. So thank you for starting with that as well. Um, I echo that sentiment. So today we will follow this format. Um, we will start first with who are the colonial ghosts? We will look at a case study in which I use the Gailly family in order to follow this study. Uh, we'll see a sketch of life on the Pigeon Squab River system. And then we will do over two um, small examples of the colonial ghosts in the archives. So my research seeks, um, seeks to find the traces of colonial ghosts in the early modern period through a study, as I've said, of the Gailly family. Um, the fact was that um, the European colonies on the Mi'kma'ki coast were actually limited in geographical space and often their sphere of political and military influence and space of information was limited to the colonial outposts um, or its direct surroundings. Um, it was by exploring the blind spots of the colonial ghost or of the colonial gaze, excuse me, that I found evidence of the lives of these ghosts. So I define colonial ghosts as being someone who came to the colony through the channels of empires and could be, for example, on a European fishing vessel, on an exploration or settlement migration. But after arriving in the colonial environment, this individual would disappear from the colonial view. In other words, these individuals disappeared from the colonial records, but they were not lost. These ghosts, um, they may have been invisible to the state, but in fact, they lived full and vibrant lives here in the Atlantic. In the archives, um, I begin to notice families and individuals who would disappear from the records in the mid 17th or late 17th century, and then have their descendants pop back up in the mid 18th. So yes, this was done after weeks and maybe more weeks and weeks of just digging through the records and noticing some of these similarities and spending many meetings with um, Stephen White, who's the genealogical expert at the Acadian Center. Um, and I wanted to understand where these branches came from, where they went, why did they fall off? And in fact, it was this question that caused me to go down a rabbit hole that leave, uh, left my first project untouched. I may, maybe a few more years before I'll pick it back up. But I followed the evidence of the Gailey family and fell into this project um, that became my dissertation. So I became intrigued by what drew the individuals outside of the colony, especially for those who had come through colonial projects to get there. And I wanted to know where they went when they disappeared. In order to answer these questions, I needed to consider alternative sources and, and interdisciplinary work. These included genealogical data like baptisms, birth and death records, court proceedings, colonial maps, as well as archaeological and anthropological studies, um, interviews, as well as working with um, Acadian and Mi'kmaq elders and educators on fishing and hunting traditions and kinship practices in these two communities. Notably, um, once I posited that the, co the, the ghosts maybe were in Mi'kma'ki, 
I found that these were two sets of data, both the Akkadian and the Mi'kmaq um, archives that had been rarely considered together, um, especially when it came to Le Havre. And so it became a space where I continually would try and compare the data sets, find different information and compare these two that didn't often um, overlap. They overlapped in geography, but not maybe in historiography. So if you notice the maps that I have on the screen, the left details the limits of the European um, control in the region in the early um, 18th century. And the second is a sketch of Samuel de Champlain from the harbor of Le Havre when he first arrives in the 1630s. Both of these maps hopefully will help you to think about the limitations of European influence and knowledge in this time period, both the 17th and most of the 18th century, in fact, for this coast particularly for the goings on on the Atlantic coast and on the rivers where the big moss centered their life. So again, if you look at the left map, you can see the more gray space. That's where European um, influence was around the, the colonial outposts and settlements. I'm sure you recognize many of those spaces. And the fact that the Mi'kmaq are located on the rivers at the heads of tide um, in the interior of the peninsula mean that they are even further away from this contact. So I want to just ground us again in that space, especially when we talk about the 18th century today, that the contact um, in these regions is limited. So returning to the Acadian genealogical data for a second, I want to show you these um, uh, what are they called? Excel sheets that I have. Now, I know you can't read them. That's fine. What I want you to notice is um, the coloring system that I have. So this is just one fragment of the database that I created on the Gailey family, where I tried to follow the names of, of who we had, where the descendants and where they went. And this is actually part of a project that will be coming out next year for the Repensé Acadie dans le monde book project where I tried to trace them after the deportation and looked at, at Gaidries and Mi'kmaq in um, Newfoundland. But what if you see on this map here on the Excel sheet, you can see the different colored tabs on the bottom to try and highlight the, the diversity of where the Gaidri family went. And you see some of them are going to France and then Louisiana, you see some of them are going to the American colonies and some of them are staying in Canada, whether that be in Canada in a settled uh, settler colonial colony or whether that be in Mi'kmaq. And so I, I was doing this work to try and get my mind around the family. Um, as many know, the family is headed by Claude Guédry and his wife, Marguerite Petitpas, and they had 11 children. And so from those children, five of the lines disappear from the Acadian records. So I submit to you that those five Guédry lines, that among them, some of them ended up in Mi'kma'ki. Um, and once again, today we see um, Guédry's descendants both in the Acadian and in the Mi'kmaq lines. And I found that fascinating that you have vibrant community members in both. You have people that are very strongly as are here today, present in the Acadian Gaelic community, as well as you have prominent Mi'kmaq members as well. So it was that question that drew me into this family. So looking at the records, now that we don't see that uh, very colorful slide ahead of you, um, I, it revealed to me a few patterns that sparked my curiosity. So I've distilled it here to four points for you today. First, that the numbers of uh, a number of these families disappeared for two or three generations and then reappeared. Those were those that I had the traces for. Obviously, some will just disappear and we don't have them in the Acadian records anymore. Um, that's uh, work I do in my dissertation. Two, um, that these families were usually fishermen and hunters of those I followed at Le Havre. Um, three, the families res resided at or around La Havre Harbor, so Pigeonisquab, which is the Mi'kmaq name. Um, and this was a relatively isolated space from Acadian standards, so from the colonial output and knowledge base. Um, and then finally, four, these families had histories of connection and or belonging in the Mi'kmaq community. So I centered on um, that aspect of the family. So naturally, there were other Acadian families that were also located between Pubnico and Lunenburg, so that, that southern Atlantic coast of the peninsula. Um, and so when I spoke to researchers and I dug into the research on this, the common response I got was that, yes, there's an acknowledged proximity to the Indigenous communities, but little detail beyond this, except for perhaps the Meuse family, um, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. 
Um, and so it was generally understood that the Mies family or the Mies family had intermarried with indigenous people. Um, and so that one was kind of a given when I'd speak to scholars. And it made me wonder if I could find um, what I could find, especially if I looked at the, the Mi'kmaq sources and I tried to understand how they incorporated or understood Europeans being among them. Um, I did not accept the claim, which I heard often, that these small French colonial outposts of one or two families were surviving on their own. In my mind, they needed help or partnership from the Mi'kmaq community, especially being larger in number on the same river system. So even though there was greater evidence for the Mias family, and obviously um, scholarship um, acknowledges that fact, that they were already integrated into the Mi'kmaq community, I decided to focus on the Gaydri family because I thought the case would need a higher burden of proof. Um, at the same time, I felt that the implications of a study like this could affect our understanding of other families in the region. In other words, it came as no surprise that a researcher might say that the Mi'kmaq family had Mi'kmaq ties, but that's because we have records of marriage and progeny to prove it. But what if the Gaydri family that had a limited genealogical interweavings but had contextual and cultural evidence instead? Um, could, it, could not a positive study on this case demonstrate something larger about the cultural and social practices of Mi'kmaq even for Europeans who had come through colonial system? So could that not tell us more about life in the 18th century if beyond marriage, if you see this cultural connection occurring and what that might mean um, socially and kinship wise? So furthermore, the fact that we have a vibrant community of Gaelic descendants in Acadian, Cajun, and Mi'kmaq communities told me that this was a more dynamic story than simply luring, um, like the lure of indigenous life pulling Acadians away in the 18th century. So rather than this, or sorry, rather this study reveals the complex set of cultural and political entanglements surrounding Atlantic families and how they negotiated their individual agency in the 18th century. Individuals and kin groups in the Gaidley family were actively choosing to go in or out of the Mi'kmaq and Acadian communities. A few of these liminal events were the Anglo-Mi'kmaq Wars in the 1710s and 20s, the Seven Years' War, the encroachment of the British in Nova Scotia, and of course, the Grand Dérangement. Today, there are, um, as I said, branches in both communities. My research on the Gaidry family provides an opportunity to present a concept, that of colonial ghosts, and how these actors negotiated the 18th century circumstances in which they found themselves. They are certainly not the only colonial ghosts, but rather as a case study to help illuminate this reality in the early modern Atlantic and help you find ghosts in your own research. So, da -da -da. Um, it should be noted at this point that this research does not make a claim for Atlantic Métis or Acadian Métis in the Atlantic Canada. This research explores cultural and kinship in the 18th century. The Gaidley family lived near or within the Mi'kmaq community, um, but around the time of the Grand Dérangement, the communities were severed and scattered. Some of the Gaidley lines rejoined um, Acadian, Acadian communities who had been also fleeing the British, while others who were already integrated within the Mi'kmaq community remained within that community and have done so for three centuries. By the late 18th century, most the Mi'kmaq and Acadian branches of these communities had been separated and remained separate. Um, this means that this reader does not argue for a Métis community in the Atlantic, but instead captures a moment of cultural and community adoption in the early modern period. My research hopes to underline the space that existed for the ghosts to live outside of the purview of the colonial project and for their agency to choose the life for themselves, whether within the colony, within Nidmagi, or elsewhere. So now I will discuss a few examples that I located um, in the archives and start that with centering life on the river. Um, I think that's why I like Terry's background picture so much. So here, um, I'll, again, I'll start with the images. On the left, we have an image taken by Roger Lewis, who's the Mi'kmaq historian and curator for the Nova Scotia Museum. You have here a V-shaped weir in the river system. Um, and then on the right, I have a map of the Pijinisquab Lahav river system. And so it shows you in that darker blue category, all of the river system, which includes the interior lakes and estuaries and the entire riverbed going down to the mouth and the harbor. Um, and the little, they have that um, expanded square where it shows um, 
Bridgewater, which is around where the head of tide is. And that's where um, the Mi'kmaq community would have settled and been based around, moving up and down the river system for different needs, but being centered around the head of tide. All right, so life along the river. In the late 17th and early 18th centuries, the Gately family lived on the Atlantic coast of Mi'kma'ki in or around Miligwesh or on the Pijanisquab river system. Uh, life on the Pijanisquab was relatively isolated from colonial life on the Bay of Fundy, remembering other picture being on the other side of the peninsula for those that are not familiar. And so they were also isolated from much of the anglo mi'kmaq conflicts in the late 17th century. Instead, those who lived on the river system had most contact with the fishermen and traders who came up and down the Atlantic coast. The colonial ghosts and the Mi'kmaq families formed a community since around the 1680s that shared culture, language, and indigenous subsistence practices. Uh, um, European, or sorry, These European and Mi'kmaq families fished and hunted according to Mi'kmaq traditional methods using fishing weirs, eels and light, lobster leisters, spears, hunting, um, hunting traps, and snowshoes, just to name a few. They fished from the abundance available along the river system, which included eel, gaspejo, and salmon. They dug for clams, foraged for berries, and hunted for seals, moose, bears, and otters. The families, both Mi'kmaq and French alike, spoke Mi'kmaq and participated in Mi'kmaq gatherings where they danced, sung, and heard Mi'kmaq stories. Many of you probably are aware that Acadians also used a, numbers of the, a number of these indigenous traditions, and we have accounts of these in um, the writings of Nicolas Denis, Samuel de Champlain, uh, Joseph Rabineau de Villebon. Um, but for those who lived outside of the borders of the French colony, they lived like at the Have in a dominant Mi'kmaq culture, not in a French culture with indigenous exchanges. Um, the historian Gregory Kennedy from the University of Moncton noted that life for the communities at Pabancous or um, Cap Cape Sable at the bottom of the peninsula and La Have were in fact very similar to their indigenous neighbors with a subsistence practice that relied on hunting, fishing, and trade. Kennedy further stated that the woods, woods meaning the interior, remained an indigenous territory during the Acadian period. Kennedy, along with historians William Wicken, um, um, Jeffrey Plank, and John McFerger affirm that the interior of Nova Scotia, of the Nova Scotian Peninsula, including Pijanisquab and the Lahav River system, was under Mi'kmaq control until the mid 18th century. All this should point to the fact that scholars have noted the influence of Indigenous people on the Acadians at Grand Prix and Port Royal, that it was in fact much more the case for those who lived in the heart of Mi'kma'ki as the colonial ghost did. 19th century historian Rameau de Saint-Père described what he thought was life among the French residing at, at La Havre in his work in Colonie Féodale. He described the French in this region, like Argos, as, quote-unquote, a peuple de métis, so the people, uh, métis people, um, who were more fishermen and hunters than farmers. By the use of the word métis, Rameau, in fact, signifies that they were people who were culturally and sometimes genetically mixed. Rameau further depicts, um, quote, these French families at that have as remaining in a state of, quote, unquote, savagery, as an, and in an Indian territory, quote, um, where life was lived half civilized and half savage. Now, he described, um, he describes their lifestyle as the life of the vagabond of hunters and trading, and those who, quote, lived year round in the woods, either living alone or in families spread out along the out with the chiefs of the savages or traders like those who lived at La Havre or Miligwesh. Now, peeling back Rameau's very problematic worldview of the Mi'kmaq, we can see that he saw the French in this region, including the Gaydris, as living a distinct and particularly indigenized life around Pijanisquab. Furthermore, historian Tom Peace, who studies Mi'kmaq Acadian history at Pubnico, um, noted that the French there had a larger dependence on the Mi'kmaq at Pubnico than elsewhere in Acadie. Peace attributes the greater dependence on the distance of Pubnico from the colonial villages, which included indigenous subsistence practices and community support. Colonial administrators saw the special circumstances of the French at Pubnico so uh, that without the help of the Mi'kmaq, the French would not have been able to survive. 
Peace did not include Lahav in his study, but he acknowledged that the level of dependence and the colonial distance at Lahav was far greater than found at Pabniko, and thus the interaction would have necessitated or necessarily been greater. This brings me to one important understanding of life along the Atlantic coast. The fact that the Europeans at Pubnico and around the Pigeon Squab had adopted indigenous subsistence practices indicates that these communities are working alongside communities, these communities in a regular and meaningful way. The simple fact that the practices of processing large quantities of clams or the meat of a bear at an eat all feast would bring together the neighborhood to work together um, in order to get all of that work done and to minimize waste. And during those events, they told stories, they danced, they sang song and they shared advice. Um, they required to bring the neighbors together and to work as a powerful bonding event for the community and community cohesion. It was during this daily work in the seasonal rhythms of life in Mi'kmaq that the colonial ghosts learned the Mi'kmaq culture, language, and skills. Young girls worked alongside their moms, hearing the stories and engaging in Mi'kmaq life and values. Similarly, young men grew up alongside their fathers and uncles on hunting trips and developing their skills. With the remaining time, I would like to give you two examples of the colonial ghosts in the archives. Um, as I've previously mentioned, colonial ghosts don't appear extensively in the archives, so we can get glimpses of, glimpses of them when we consider them against the archival grain, as well as in connection with other scholarship traditions, such as archaeology and anthropology, to see their stories. Um, and again, on the screen to guide you, I have um, pictures of the harbor and the coast. Um, our two stories will be in Miligwesh, which on the map on the right, you can see I have that circle region, which marks um, an indigenous pathway, Miligwesh being the northern harbor there, which is now Lunenburg, and then traveling down to the Lahav Harbor and how connected these were um, into the same system. All right. So in the early 18th century, the British began to encroach on the borders of Mi'kmaq. So during the period before 1761, the British in Mi'kma in the, and the Mi'kmaq had a series of military offensive offenses, um, especially in the 1710s and 20s. The Acadians had newly returned under the British flag after the seizure of Pas Royale in 1710, but this was the period when the British began to seek inroads in Mi'kmaq and the Mi'kmaq elders sought to defend their territorial and political sovereignty. I will briefly look at two events where we see the colonial ghosts participate in the struggle against the British. The first event was from 1715 and the second from 1726. These events reveal the Gaedri participation in the military defense of the Mi'kmaq community and their presence in the social networks. The majority of the, of the battles in the early 18th century were on the water or in the ports and harbors on the coast. Um, there was in fact an onslaught um, of English fishing vessels that had been captured by the Mi'kmaq. Correspondence uh, um, from Lun, uh, Louisbourg, sorry, Correspondence from Louisbourg recorded that the Mi'kmaq had seized at least 80 fishing vessels um, and trading ships between 1713 and 1760. But historian Olivia Dickinson um, contends that these numbers um, don't sufficiently demonstrate the power of the Mi'kmaq defense of their coast. The British offensive included attacks on the harbor harbors like Le Havre and Miligwesh, um, which we now call Lunenburg. And um, in 1715, we see an article about this. The journal um, called the Boston Newsletter reported one such event in 1715, which included a Gaedry family member. According to the article, Captain O'Dwyron of New England was captured by, quote, 47 Indians at Miligwesh. The report goes on to state that, quote, as soon as Mr. Lavaldil heard, he immediately expressed his son to Minus, Minus with an account of it whereupon they dispatched Captain Walker, an Indian of great power and influence, who no sooner came among them than he rescued the prisoners and delivered up the vessels to them, end quote. While the Boston newspaper presents Claude Guédry, called La Verdure in this, um, as an English sympathizer and French Good Samaritan, examining the evidence given reveals Guédry's role in supporting the Mi'kmaq. Um, Claude Guidry and his son were involved in the Mi'kmaq community already at La Havre. Um, and when the event occurred with Captain Odwaron, it was his son uh, that he sent on the urgent task of getting the Mi'kmaq elder or chief back to from Minas. 
The action demonstrates the confidence of the community at Pigeony Squab and Claude that he had in his son to be able to retrieve the Sagamo and demonstrate their active presence in both the local and extended Mi'kmaq community in order to achieve this feat. Naturally, the young Guédry um, would have needed the knowledge of the language and customs in the Mi'kmaq community to be able to convince Captain Walker to come back to Pigeony Squab with him. Similarly, um, or sorry, secondarily, um, this also points to the fact that he had he had needed sufficient portage and canoeing, canoeing skills in order to traverse this terrain quickly and effectively. This may not seem like a big deal, but Minas, Minas was located across the peninsula about 75 miles away from Miliguesh and would have required, an, required expert canoe and portage spill, st skills to traverse this terrain, especially quickly. By comparison, when New French Intendant de Meul had to cross the peninsula, he was um, told by the Acadians that the journey was quote unquote impossible. De Meul described the journey to be quote, one of the hardest he could have made in a lifetime, end quote. He describes the mountainous terrain, numerous lengthy portages, the treacherous rapids and watersheds. He says that he only survived by the quick strength and skill of the three Mi'kmaq guides that he had with him. So in the case of Claude Guédry, he had confidence in his son's ability to navigate these waters and do it quickly. Notably, the young Guédry goes to the Mi'kmaq chief and not um, the Acadian administrator or the British official um, in order to protect the French at Naha, which I think is another indication of his, uh, his connection into Mi'kmaq and not Acadie. The Boston newsletter gave the impression that Claude, Claude Guédry was acting um, on efforts to save the English captain. But if he had, he would have likely have gone to Pa Royal. On the contrary, the Boston newsletter articles provides us with evidence of the Gaelic involvement as they acted at a minimum as messengers between the Mi'kmaq bands um, without having direct evidence in this article of any role in the attack um, on Captain Dwyran, O'Dwyran's vessel. Um, securing Captain Walker to Miliguesh was a chance to assert Mi'kmaq sovereignty on the harbor. So the second case still finds us on the shores at Miliguesh, today Lunenburg, but about a decade later in 1726. The tension between the Mi'kmaq and the British um, con continued, um, and we see a, gro a group of local Mi'kmaq, including the Gaedri and Mies Kin, who planned an attack on an English vessel. The goal of the seizure was to use the ship and its crew as hostages in order to negotiate for the release of some of their family who were being held in Boston as prisoners of war. Two of these prisoners were Claude Guédry, or sorry, Paul Guédry and Francis Muse. When the attack, uh, the Mi'kmaq attack on the crew went awry, five of the men were captured and taken to Boston to stand trial as pirates. The surviving court transcripts give us another chance to see um, the colonial ghosts in the Gailey family. You might have already noticed that within this story, I've kind of snuck another one inside. These Mi'kmaq prisoners of war were included a Gailey and a Muse. During the previous skirmish three years earlier in 1723, the commander Joseph Marjorie described all of the captives and labeled them as quote unquote Indians. This meant that the British captain saw them as indigenous or at least part of the local band and either is telling. It also includes Paul Guédry as someone who would get involved with Mi'kmaq conflicts against the British. So returning to the 1726 piracy records. These records provide some documentation of the lives of two colonial ghosts. So despite the division of the trial in French and Indian trials, which I can expand upon in questions if there are questions, as well as the fact that the Acadians were not at war with the British in 1726, um, thus if his identity and network had in fact been with the Acadians, he would not have participated in this attack. There are other things I wanna focus in the last few minutes. So the testimony of Jean-Baptiste Guédry and his son reveal their belonging in the indigenous life and social networks at the Pigeonie Squab River system. Even the short um, defense that was given for the Guédry father and his son um, tell us that they lived among the Mi'kmaq and away from the colonial life to the extent that his son had no official documentation that he had been raised and he had been raised and educated among the Mi'kmaq. Um, both spoke Mi'kmaq and Jean-Baptiste Sr was the one was one of the ones who orchestrated uh, the Mi'kmaq defense on the coast. His leadership role alongside his Mi'kmaq kin demonstrates his investment in Mi'kmaq as well as his willingness to defend their lands and their people. 
These two short examples demonstrate how we can use the archives to go hunting for colonial ghosts when we have an eye for cultural and kinship evidence. It also reveals the need to recover an indigenous understanding of these spaces. To view La Havre as only an Acadian um, colonial outpost, even a defunct one, um, obscures the fact that the coast was and operated by Mi'kmaq politics and networks. When you recover that view of Pigeon Esquave from the early 18th century, suddenly the language of Claude or Jean Baptiste can be better understood. Um, this only, um, sorry, only speaking, uh, this only speaks, sorry, for the reading of primary, textual primary sources and even some brief local geopolitics, but even you can see that adding that then to the rich layers of indigenous land use, archaeological studies, and anthropological and cultural studies, you can begin to layer um, the evidence and the ghosts become corporeal. In fact, you can start to see them. So thank you so much for your time today, and I would love to answer questions and chat with anyone um, if you have any questions. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, really interesting information uh, in that area of the province for sure. Um, we'll open it up for questions now. We have, uh, we can start things off with a question from our uh, chat <clears throat> uh, from Sandra. Would the Mi'kmaq capture uh, so many of the boats not be regarded as an act of war? Did the British have to declare war for there to, for there to be in fact a war? <clears throat> That's maybe okay, so if I'm understanding the question, then saying like, was the fact that the Mi'kmaq ca were capturing all these vessels an act of war? Yes, I think that's the question. Yes, absolutely. In the 1710s and 20s, there was active warfare between the British and um, the Mi'kmaq. Um, and this case in this, this decade is actually a really mm -hmm. interesting time if you look at British imperial and colonial advance, because they're trying to subdue a region and they're trying to tell officials that they have it under control when in fact the Mi'kmaq are responding loudly that it's not under control. So that's why the difference between being labeled as French or um, Mi'kmaq makes a really big difference because the French are already considered British subjects and they're working to kind of incorporate them into that legal framework. And so the case, the piracy trial is actually a really significant case for kind of the British trying to extend two types of authority, one on a community they think they have control over, and one kind of a projection of power trying to stop um, the Mi'kmaq from continuing to advance. But yes, absolutely, it's an act of war, um, and they're they're hoping to tell the British to stay out. Great question. Um, so if you have questions, you can either <clears throat> unmute yourself or put your hand up or chat in the group. Uh, Carol is asking, did any of the English or Scottish settlers have relationships with the Mi'kmaq? Did any of the English or Scottish settlers? Oh, interesting. Um, so as I said, especially like I focus on the La Havre community. So at this point, we see Lunenburg being settled in 1753, if I'm not mistaken, my date there. So we see layers of history in that same harbor um, around the war for the like the Seven Years' War. We will see some British soldiers um, defect and run into Mi'kmaq communities and there kind of becomes a, a, a pastime of the Mi'kmaq to accept the British soldiers who come in. Um, so there are some connections that come in from, from the British for sure. Um, there's older, um, old Scottish settlements as well in the region. So there is some speculation about some of the early French. Sometimes that's why I say European settlers, because there could be even Claude Gabriel, we don't know his origin. So there's some question about there could be some Scottish descendants there, um, as well as the mid 17th century, um, newcomers. So I would, I wouldn't exclude that. Um, I would just say Europeans are joining and there is space before the British start codifying, dividing things that that's happening. Um, I have a question, I guess. Um, just wondering how you uh, found focus on this on this topic and 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 uh, narrowed in on on this being a topic of your dissertation. Uh, as I said, it was a rabbit hole that I loved. Um, so I wanted. I am a, I'm Acadian myself, and so my grandmother is a Melanson, and I said I'm going to look. And I think I can see Marty Gailey here. So I looked at the three brothers, um, Pierre, Claude, and Jean. And Jean, which is just a rogue and not a great person, he ends up stealing 17 Indigenous people, selling them in the Azor Islands, coming back to Boston and getting picked up by the by the authorities because you can't, well, you could do that 
during the Phillips War, but not a great guy, right? So I was like, where? And then he jumps bail and he disappears. And I thought, where did he go? And I was so intrigued by this idea. And I posited, did he become Claude Guedry? And it was finding Marty Guedry's website that I was like, no, they did the genealogical evidence. They did the DNA testing. It's not him. But when I found the Guedry family, I was really struck by those conversations with historians and, and the kind of, yes, yeah, something's happening there, but nobody's really looked at it. And I don't think people understood the extent to which people could be intrigued and lured by what could be offered to them outside the colony. It was you know, kind of the colony or nothing. And when you looked outside this, there was a lot of opportunity for a life lived differently. And I do think this maps onto um, uh, métier, I'm trying to think of the English word, the, your, your occupation. The fact that the Acadian landscape is a lot more farming and sedentary, and a lot of these families are hunters and fishermen, and so I think they're they're blending better, and we're getting better research now in the Acadian um, scholarship looking at it's not just everyone's egalitarian in Acadie. There's actually stratified social hierarchy. There's people on the top. There's people on the bottom, and so I think that for the Gaelis, they found kinship and connection by sharing daily life, by fishing and hunting. And it kind of became a natural extension of that, even if they didn't marry in. Great, thanks. We do have a few more questions coming into the chat now. Uh, Wesley uh, says, great presentation, Nicole. Thank you. Your dissertation went straight into my uh, citation manager during your presentation. I'll, I'm sure I'll do the same here soon. Uh, do we know where at the Lehave Le did the colonial ghost families live between Brazili's occupation and 18th century defense of the river system. Sorry, explain the middle part. Did they, where they live on the river system? Where exactly? Do you know where did colonial ghost families live between Brazili's occupation? Yeah, I think where on the river system. Oh, okay, Brazili's, okay. So yeah, so uh, for the older history of the coast, that's a great question, Wesley. So yeah, they settle in the 1630s at La Havre. And if you remember this, by this by 1636, when Fazidi dies, they move it to Pas Royal and the colony kind of, there's, there's it's clear a reference that people stay back. Um, I don't know if uh, the Gaedry family, it seems like they arrive 50 years later. There's kind of no evidence that they're some of the original members, but there are original people there. And my hypothesis is that those that stay back are part of the, the soldiers, the garrison, the fort, some who are either already connected in with the Mi'kmaq, and so people who weren't planning to do sedentary farming and families on the other side. So I think that that seeds um, come in from that time period and they remain because um, there's only scant evidence. There's evidence they rebuilt the, the fort at La Havre, um, and then you have the Scottish come in. Um, and then where they are, I kind of mind some of the records like the 1636 or 1726 records for this. Um, they call it a plantation around the, the Cape. So I don't know if it's further up in Miliguash. There seems to be a French house for the, the Mother Gaedry that's right on the mouth of the, the La Havre River. There seems to be what they call a plantation, which I think is the, Euro the British way of talking about multiple houses side by side around at the have around that Miliguesh and then some the the uncles live further up the river at the head of tide great thanks um kind of a two-part question from riley uh to clarify it seems that the acadians learned the Mi'kmaq language uh as well did the Mi'kmaq learn french Oh, good question. Um, it's, I mean, I'm assuming those that were dealing with trading relationships would have probably been um, mm -hmm. familiar with the trading pigeon. Um, we don't have any evidence um, kind of either way. I'm assuming they were somewhat familiar with it. Um, but even Jean-Baptiste Jr., um, he's, it just seems like they're, they're speaking Mi'kmaq a lot more than anything else, at least from the records and, and beyond that. So I don't know, but it seems like they have some sort of knowledge for trading. Sure. Um, Denise asks, uh, were there confrontations with the French Protestants who came to settle in Lunenburg? Uh, you're asking a question outside of the scope of what yeah. I look at. Um, I think it's a fantastic question. We do know that, um, was it Paul Guedry? So I'm going from memory here. I think Marty could probably answer better than me, but Paul Guedry comes back. So he goes back and forth between like what happens. And I, I cover this in my dissertation, like when the British start encroaching and they settle in Halifax, 
This is really close and alarming for the Mi'kmaq community. And so they begin to move into Cape Breton. And so we see some stay there and some move north. And I think um, Padre is an example of somebody who is um, a pilot um, fisherman. Mm -hmm. He's going up and down the coast and keeping kind of two hubs. Um, but a lot of, we see both those that want to go into to the, the French side in Cape Breton and those that stay in the Mi'kmaq are moving to Cape Breton at that point. Um, and then they will come back about 10 or 15 years later and try and I think reclaim the land once the war is settled a little bit. So um, I don't know, I can't answer the question about the conflict, but there is a return after. So that's a great question. These may be some some of them are in your uh, a little bit outside your scope, or in uh, so as much as you can answer them, be great. Um, but uh, Michael asks, did the Mi'kmaq let enslaved African Nova Scotians and in, in uh, into their tribes escaped uh, enslaved people, perhaps? So this is a really good question. I think the way that I can address it, because I don't in this topic look in the later period, but what I think you're asking, which was kind of a heart of my question, is how does adoption work? Like who's let in, who's not, and why? Mm -hmm. And so I can say that a lot of this was working um, with some Mi'kmaq um, anthropologists and speaking to people like Roger Lewis um, about how this works. Um, because as I said, with the Métis question, this is, this is big. And so what I've understood is that somebody who lives in the community, participates in the community, becomes a member of the community. And in the 18th mm -hmm. um, century, there was a lot more space, especially... Um, the demographics of the Mi'kmaq weren't terribly harmed by epidemics. They were actually doing okay. They didn't need a really high birth rate to keep the, the cohesion of the community, but they still needed additional members for some of the processing and, and regular um, food necessities of the community. So having another person, another body and pair of hands who can help and who's willing to help is wonderful. So in my reading and speaking with people like Roger Lewis, um, it's that welcoming in, if you're willing to learn and be part, um, and especially for these kids who are being raised up. So um, I didn't see, and in fact, he even mentioned contemporary Mi'kmaq who are, he's, he said, not a drop of indigenous blood, but live and know the community, are part of the community, and they've raised up with each other. So I would say um, for the African-American enslaved community, there wouldn't be kind of a prejudice that way. It'd be whether they'd be willing to be incorporated. Uh, Sandra asks, did, uh, com I think you've kind of already answered this, but uh, did conversations with Mi'kmaq elders provide stories which supported your ghost hypothesis, or is this evidence based primarily on European records? Love this question. This is super important to me because I've, I've read a number of dissertations and it was often the case where when I'd actually speak to Mi'kmaq people, they'd be like, that doesn't make sense. Like he'd be like, that's not how that works. And so I would ask questions and I would say, but how does this work? And so they would explain and, and explain kind of things from that really practical kind of passed down oral stories and cultural knowledge. And so, yes, this entire dissertation, I would share and talk about my theories and how I thought, well, this is what the records say. And I think one of my favorite um, ways that it was explained to me was when I showed you the map of Samuel de Champlain, it's of the coast, right? He has the nautical marks in the water. And he says, that's what the Europeans see. They see the coast. And he's like, if you picture, which maybe all of you can, picture the coast of Nova Scotia and the tree line, He's like, you can't see us at the head of tide. And we are, you know, if you look at um, Bridgewater, however many kilometers in from the coast, I can't remember off the top of my head if it's 30 kilometers or 50, but you're you're a hike and you can't see it from the water. So he's like the, the British or the French or whoever has to either come up the river system to the head of tide to find us, or they assume we're not there. And the fact that their, their colonial gaze and limit is kind of the tree line, um, can help you see why sometimes we have projects that that kind of diverge when you don't speak to indigenous peoples themselves and ask questions about how they live. So it was really helpful. Um, like speaking to people like Roger Lewis was like just eye opening um, mm -hmm. for me. Sure. Um, Christopher's asking, and I apologize for my pronunciation of uh, any and all names uh, today. Is there any record of what happened to Jian? Um, I, 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 what's the sorry the last name of the oh, uh thank you sorry to everyone <laughs> the no the, so the, you mean um uh, yeah. jean-baptiste the two daughter, the, daughter of claude and uh Kescua. 
a Mi'kmaq woman? Oh, oh, good question. Um, that daughter was actually one of the ones that I was like, maybe, maybe it is Jean Laverdure. And again, I'm looking at Marty being like, he knows it's not. No, I don't have any evidence. Like when you look at the Kesquit, when you look at her, um, for those who know, it's like Claude Guedry was in La Havre, um, I'm going off memory, I think 1686, but 1681, he has a child over in the Beaubassin region. And there's no one from, we have no data, but that is completely normal. We don't have the genealogical data for the Mi'kmaq in the 17th and 18th century. And so she would have been raised in the Mi'kmaq community. Um, so we don't know whether she would have survived or not, but there's, because we don't have the information doesn't mean she didn't make it. It's just, she just didn't come to the have with them. Great. Uh, Margie asks, do you know anything about uh, a French settlement at Brick Hill on, on Second Peninsula? No, I don't. I would like to know more about this. Maybe someone else can answer that in the chat. Yes. Um, iPad viewer asks, when did they go to Louisiana? Perhaps. When did the Gabriels go to Louisiana? Yes, I think that's the question. Yeah, so um, it's kind of a roundabout story because I said they're they're on the coast. And this is what I find fascinating when you look into colonial ghosts is it's just because so much. Now, I understand that we're interdisciplinary here, so we can share different methods. Um, but in history, we're so nailed to the page. What does it say? What does the map say? And I found that it was so lacking in this case to actually tell that story because a ghost disappears, but they're not gone. They're just not in your little record. And so... Um, we see the way they make these choices. So by around the 1740s, we watched the community split and some, which I think by natural agency, thought their chances might be better if they jumped back into the French community. And so they go to Louisbourg, they, they join back. Um, others who feel their chances are better staying in the Mi'kmaq community stay there. So it, it kind of diverges the community. Um, so how they get to Louisiana is they are deported to France by most people are heading to France for about 30 years. And then when they try various colonial projects in France and it's not going well, they will then accept Spain's offer to come to Louisiana and settle again. And they thought, which I mean, they said, well, these Acadians have experience in colonial projects. They're tough and rigorous. Let's send them to the swamps. It's completely the same as Nova Scotia. And so it was kind of a new a new settlement project there. Um, but it comes roundabout. There are a few that come across the American colonies, um, but it's kind of a long journey for those that end up in Louisiana. Um, Christopher Guidry has a, a follow up just to the um, question regarding um, Jeanne and Cloud. Uh, his son, Charles, uh, Christopher's great grandfather, eighth generation, married Morning Morningstar. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, and I think I did read yeah. that in a in one of the genealogy books. Um, that's just not the family I follow closely, but I remember reading that. Um, Emmanuel's asking, "How do we get a copy of the presentation?" So that'll that'll go up under our YouTube channel pretty soon here. Um, I'd say within a week or so. So um, the Nova Scotia Archaeology Society is our YouTube channel. Um, quite a few. Um, complimentary comments here, not so much questions, but uh, lots of that. Um, if there's any, maybe I'll offer a, a moment to have one or two more questions and we'll, uh, we won't keep you for much, too much longer. Any further questions? You guys are a very generous audience. I love, my husband's like, I don't need to hear this again. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, some folks are asking for links to the YouTube channel. It's literally, if you go to YouTube and search NS Archaeology, it'll, it will come up um, there. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Chris has a hand up here. First hand up. Um, you can unmute if you like. I think you're still muted there, Chris. Maybe I can unmute you. Hello, do you hear me now? Yes, yes we, can. we can. Hello? Hello. Hi. Yeah, um, I live on Second Peninsula, very close to Brick Hill, and my grandchildren in the summertime uh, often collect pieces of the bricks that were made by the Dontremont family who built a trading post at what they called Chi Chi Miskadi. 
Uh, it's never been properly researched. One neighbor in the area had requested permission uh, for a treasure trove license and was told at the time not to dare do any work on the site. Unfortunately, the sea hasn't stopped. And what uh, that person at the time was one of the Stevens family, Randolph Stevens Jr. And he told me that uh, when he applied for the treasure trove license, there was still a brick kiln uh, for firing bricks. Uh, and that was all there, but has since gone. <clears throat> One other thing that has uh, happened in the meantime is some clam diggers while digging clams near Lucy, which is a little island right at the head of Brick Hill, dug up a pine tree showing, uh, 1680, from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So there was a fair bit going on there. Our understanding is that it was um, Philip Muse Dontremont Jr who built the trading post and operated there. And some speculation is that because he chose to marry a big ma lady, uh, Maria, um, that uh, he wasn't, uh, how do you say? It was a bit of a black sheep in the family. And uh, it's quite possible that the um, cradle for the Muse family was in fact Brick Hill, mm. uh, because it's some word that the Dontremonts uh, were not interested in giving the, uh, her offspring the full name Muse Dontremont and mm. settle for Muse. Now, whether that is can be something that can be proven, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting thing. Mm. The other part to that is the series of drumlins that make up Brick Hill uh, are separated to the rest of the uh, peninsula by a sand beach known as Bachman's Beach, which apparently um, was the summer campground for Mi'kmaq uh, families in both what I call now the Mahone Bay and the La Haye River, and uh, it's, they were smart like a fox because when you look at the map, you will see that uh, Bachman's Beach, as it's called now, is a very low sand beach at the end of a, a funnel shaped valley caused by the drumlins that points to the southwest the prevailing wind in the summertime in Nova Scotia is southwest. Mm -hmm. In other words, the breeze would come down that funnel, accelerate because of Anuli's principle, and blow all the mosquitoes out into the home bay. Were they smart? Very much so. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's Thanks, been a Chris. fascinating and enjoyable Fantastic. lecture. Thank, and thank you for adding that. And yes, we love the black sheep. I think that's where all this comes from. Yes. Thanks, Chris. And uh, just a note to folks, if you're ever in, uh, curious about things you've found or uh, familiar with possible archaeological sites, feel free to email the Nova Scotia Archaeology Society, and we can put you in touch with the uh, provincial regulators for archaeology, uh, the Special Places Program, and uh, and uh, we can they'll they'll follow up with folks there. Great. Well, thanks so much, Nicole. Really appreciate your time and the presentation, which was very interesting. Uh, lots of uh, thanks in the chat there, too. Um, I think to I see Marty's out. hands raised, too. Uh, pardon? Marty has his hand raised, too. Oh, I don't see that. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Thank you. Marty. Uh, I just want to say a couple of things. One, about Charles Guidry and Morningstar. There never, as far as we can tell, there's never been a Morningstar. But we did find a couple of uh, primary documents in the Cuban papers from the Spanish period in Louisiana that say that those children that have been attributed to Charles are actually children of, of uh, Claude Gadry and Anne Lejeune who went to uh, France 
And then uh, Anne died there, but Charles and the children came down to Louisiana. And uh, if somebody's interested, we have, I wrote an article about it and presented those two primary documents that clarify that uh, Claude Gadry, who was the son of Augustin Gadry and Jean Hebert, was, uh, the, had the children, not Charles. As far as I know, Charles never had any children. And as far as I know, there never was a morning star. Uh, the, another item that somebody indicated, the Acadians really had two routes to get to Louisiana and Nicole covered one, the one to France. The other one was, that was the Acadians that were actually went into French territory of Cape Breton and Ile Saint Jean and was mm -hmm. sent to France in 1758 and 59. The Acadians that were exiled in the 1755 and later period went along the um, seaboard of the Atlantic because they were English citizens. They had to go to English colony since they were coming out of Nova Scotia. And those got deported to nine colonies along the Atlantic. And eventually after 1763 and the end of the French and Indian War, a number of them ended up in Louisiana. There were about 15 to 1600 in each group, the 1764 to 69 group that came to Louisiana and the 1785 group that came to Louisiana. So we had about 3,000 total people come to Louisiana. Uh, as far as the Gidrys from La Rochelle and other places, we don't know where in the heck they came from. We, we're pretty sure they came from France, but all we have is Claude Gidry's approximate age or year of birth around 1748 to 51 and nothing else. And by the way, Claude in France is about like Bill in the United States. So it's a very difficult uh, name to track down with only that information. Somebody once said there was a record in La Rochelle of a Claude Guidry in the 17, late 40s time frame, but that record has never surfaced uh, after that, whoever saw it uh, a while back. We've never seen it again, so we don't know about that. And Brick Hill, in that 1726 document that Nicole was discussing, about the uh, capture of the uh, English vessel in, ha in Merlegesh Harbor. Uh, it indicates in that document that Jean Baptiste apparently lived somewhere around Brick Hill on Second Peninsula. So it looks like Jean Baptiste, by the way, was married to a Mi'kmaq and so as well as his brother Paul. And so it looks like they may have moved to live among the Mi'kmaq on Second Peninsula near Brick Hill and all. Uh, so that's all. Great. Thanks for filling in some blanks there. Thank you. Lovely. Well, thank you so much, Nicole.